my name is David Bruce. Musicians generally are not that keen on the idea of music representing anything other than itself. Popular music and jazz are good at depicting different emotions or moods, but are rarely interested in setting a scene, telling a story, or representing things from the real world in purely musical terms. For some reason, representing reality in music seems generally to be pretty uncool. In jazz, you have a few scores by Duke Ellington depicting Harlem street scenes. The rock group Rush has a few descriptive tracks like Jacob's Ladder, which musically depicts the moment the sun breaks through the clouds. Or, to visit a less trodden area of popular music, listen to the dissonant strings depicting the constant patter of rain here in Scott Walker's It's Raining Today. It's raining today. Even in classical music, where the vast majority of this kind of descriptive music can be found, it's still pretty uncool. But at least here it has a name. It's known as program music. It ranges from full-on stories to just suggestive metaphors. In a full-on story, each scene is captured and described in the music. Here, for example, is my favourite moment in Richard Strauss's tone poem Don Quixote, in which the cello soloist plays the Don. And yes, here are a herd of sheep rather fabulously mimicked by flutter-tongued muted brass. Another famous example is Berlioz's Symphony Fantastique, which relates a series of morbid fantasies concerning the unrequited love of a sensitive poet, culminating in the poet's execution for her murder, which again is literally depicted in the music. Other examples are a bit more generalised. In Vivaldi's The Four Seasons, of course, each of the four concertos is not really telling a story, but it's depicting aspects of the season in question. One that often puzzles people is Summer, which features a storm and a downpour. This doesn't really make sense unless you visit, like I did, Vivaldi's hometown of Venice in the middle of the summer and experience the sudden and torrential downpours they get there. Other types of programme music are even less specific. Here's Martin Pearson's The Fall of the Leaf from the early 1600s. The music, you could say, is playing with nothing more than the metaphor of something gently floating downwards. But as I say, even for classical composers, it's actually a fairly embarrassing thing to admit to doing. Quite a few of the great names in classical music have either backtracked or hidden the programme, or expressed some kind of shame or embarrassment. Schumann gave programmatic titles like The Morning on the Rhine to movements of his third symphony before coyly removing them. If the eye is once directed to a certain point, the ear can no longer judge independently, he said. And I talked a bit more about this on my latest video on the London Symphony Orchestra's channel, I'll link it below. Mahler similarly removed programmatic titles from some of his symphonies. Even Beethoven, whose sixth symphony has a pretty clear programmatic thing going on, there's cuckoos, a storm, a trickling brook. He still felt it necessary to say, the whole work can be perceived without description. It's more of an expression of feelings than tone painting. The embarrassment these composers felt seems even more hypocritical when you think about things like ballet and opera. The Rite of Spring, for example, is pretty much universally acknowledged to be a masterpiece. And yet, isn't it essentially a sort of fantasy story of ancient ritual child sacrifice? The question is, would the piece be considered as much of a success if it hadn't been a ballet? Or would it be classed in the same category as a piece like Scheherazade by Rimsky-Korsakov, which my old professor called one of the best second-rate pieces of music there is. <laughs> Put it another way, here are two depictions of frogs in classical music. One is from Bieber. No, not that one. This is Heinrich Bieber, his Sonata Representiva. And this is one from Berg's opera Wozzeck. Unheimlich. 
Okay, one is a fairly light-hearted piece of instrumental music, and the other powerfully conjures the terrifying indifference of nature after a murder and a drowning. The Berg is, I would say, definitely a better piece of music, but in terms of their programmatic nature, they're both doing similar things. If anything, it seems the only real sense in which programmatic storytelling music is bad is that much of the music written as program music is second-rate. But clearly in pieces like Wozzeck, The Right, or Beethoven 6, there's no problem with it per se. One problem I think program music can suffer from is when it's really specific. Art seems to be much more powerfully received when the receiver brings something of themselves to the table. Program music done badly can be the propaganda of the music world. There's no subtlety, this chord signifies this thing. So that guillotine chop in the march to the scaffold, well, it's hard to hear that moment as anything other than the 2D cartoon drawing it is. The lack of subtlety can sometimes be felt in opera too. Wagner's operas are famous for their leitmotifs, melodies which are reeled out every time a character or an object is on stage, or even when they're just mentioned. It's a way of working which a lot of film composers have imitated, but taken too far it can have this didactic feeling that the composer's bludgeoning you over the head telling you what to think. Once you eliminate some of those overly obvious examples of representative music, you get to an area which I think is really interesting, and it's one I've explored a lot in my own music, and one of the best practitioners of this is Claude Debussy. Take his orchestral piece La Mer. This is a model piece for me in how to handle extra musical elements. There's no doubt it's a great piece of music by itself, you could happily listen to it not knowing it was anything to do with the sea. But part of the pleasure for me comes from admiring the creative talent Debussy has for throwing in endless different ways that the sea can be depicted. Whether it's a sense of movement, waves crossing or overlapping, a sense of wind hauntingly echoing over the sea surface. I did something similar with the idea of rain in my piece, The Consolation of Rain. And there were lots of drops and splashes, but also, for example, a hint of something like when you listen to rain through the window, you sometimes hear it just suddenly change tempo. Again, I think it's entirely possible to listen to the piece without knowing it's about rain, but I think that extra musical idea adds a whole extra layer an extra way in, an extra chance to form a genuine connection between the music and the listener. If you prefer, you can make things even more subtle. This is the storm at the start of Thomas Addis's opera The Tempest. He called it a geometric storm. It's not representational in the true sense. It doesn't sound literally like a storm, apart from the fact that it's pretty noisy. I suppose you could say it relates to the sound of the original in the way cubist art relates to its subject, recognisable but more abstract to some degree. I would say the same about my recent piano piece Undula, which I recently posted on my second channel, again I'll link it below. I was inspired in this piece by David Hockney's depiction of water in his Californian pool paintings. He manages to capture some essence of the water using just fairly abstract lines and gestures. I wanted to see whether I could do something similar in music. So for example, the first movement has this little phrase, and just like a little wave that gets overtaken by the next one, so the next phrase starts overlapping the previous one. In the final movement I tried to create a sort of stillness and then a sudden loud splash which sends out ripples into the music and then gradually subsides back to the start. Again it doesn't actually sound like a splash but it's a depiction at one level of abstraction. But the funny thing is, even if we're trying to write purely abstract music, or absolute music as it's sometimes called, I would argue that that's virtually impossible. Music by its very nature has aspects that just come across to us like things from the real world. Things falling, things coming nearer, things going round and round, a sense of space, perspective, distance. Just as we can't help seeing a face on the moon or in the shape of a mountain, we can't help but read meaning into music's shapes and patterns. Sometimes we find things even when they weren't originally there. Aaron Copland, for example, wrote his famous ballet Appalachian Spring, thinking only of the dancer Martha Graham who would premiere the ballet. I was really putting Martha Graham to music. I had seen her dancing so many times and I had a sense of her personality as a creative artist. 
I had a really in the front of my mind, I wasn't thinking about the Appalachians or even spring. Um, so that I had no title for it. It was a ballet for Martha, was the, actually the subtitle that I had. Later, when he saw the ballet, he asked Martha what she would call the piece. She said, Appalachian Spring. Oh, I said, what a nice name. Where'd you get it? <laughs> <laughs> she said, well, it's the title of a poem by Hart Crane. Oh, I said, uh, does the poem have anything to do with the ballet? She said, no, I just like the title and I took it. <laughs> but this hasn't stopped people hearing both Appalachia and Spring in the music. And over and over again nowadays, people come up to me after seeing the ballet on stage and say, Mr. Copeland, when I see that ballet and when I hear your music, I can just see the Appalachians and feel things. <laughs> so I think this ability we have to find meaning and hear things in music is one reason why trying to say that music should be pure and abstract seems faintly ridiculous. And like Aaron Copeland, you can manipulate the listener in a certain direction by a well-chosen title. But even if you don't, they will find their own stories there, whether you want them to or not. We still haven't solved the puzzle of why there are so few examples of this sort of thing in pop and jazz. You can see the benefit of a large orchestral palette for depicting different scenes, and that's perhaps one reason that the rare examples of jazz program music are found in the big band. But what about, for example, the palette you can get from electronic music? You can basically use any sound you want. I really find it hard to understand why there isn't more of this kind of thing. So depending on what type of music you write, I would say I have two suggestions for you. For us classical musicians, it's time for us to get less hung up on abstract music and embrace program music as being not in and of itself a bad thing it's all about how you do it and for those of you in the jazz rock or electronic music worlds well this seems like a niche that's just waiting to be filled all it needs is a little creativity and a little imagination do let me know in the comments if I've overlooked any examples of this kind of representational music in the pop and the jazz world. I'm really honestly amazed how few examples I could think of. Thanks so much for watching and thanks as ever to my patrons over at Patreon. Do like and subscribe and share with your friends and I'll see you next time.